Efficiency, How to Win PPC Business, featuring Aaron Sagan. We're super excited for everyone to be on the line today. Um, guys, if you're in Boston today and you feel like getting out of the office at the end of the day, we are having a happy hour at Wistia's office in Cambridge. Um, we're more than excited if you guys want to come out, have some beers, hear us talk about PPC and video for your agency. Um, but without further ado, let's get today started. So, um, one second, just before we kick things off, I do have a poll for you guys. Sorry about that. We want to learn a little bit about uh, your pain points as an agency so that we can give you some guidance here. So, guys, what is your biggest pain point? Are you having trouble finding new clients? Are you having trouble selling your clients on adopting new tactics? Do you have problems retaining your current clients? Um, or do you have problems proving the results to your clients? What are your biggest PPC pain points? And it looks like a staggering 75% of you guys have a problem finding new clients. Really interesting. Awesome. Well, this is a great session for you. Erin is going to go ahead and uh, kick this puppy off, guys. So we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you guys at Wistia. And Erin, why don't you go ahead and take us away. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to see, he, see all of you guys here um, and even more excited to hear that. Some of your biggest pain points are signing new clients because I think I have a lot of tips that can help you do this today. Um, so first things first, I have to make a confession to you. You probably won't be thrilled to see. Uh, full disclosure, I am not a salesperson at all. In fact, when I was a kid, my uh, I went to this private school, this Catholic school, and the nuns wanted to drill in this sales knowledge early. So they used to send us out to do fundraisers every fall. And we had to sell these candy bars, and each student had a quota. And so me and my brother and sister, we would kind of don our uniforms on Saturday afternoons. We'd strap these chocolate bars around our necks, almost like little cigar girls at a bar. And we would literally go door to door throughout the neighborhood, peddling these candy bars on behalf of our elementary school. And we never sold a single one. And the worst part is, whenever anybody said no, we would give them away. We'd be like, okay, take one anyway. Um, so needless to say, we were, we were pretty terrible salespeople. My mom would get so infuriated by this that she would just buy the quota herself and stop sending us out around, around the block because we just, we just couldn't sell. Um, and, and this kind of lack of a sales bone in my body carried on to adulthood. Um, so when I first started here at WordStream, if you asked me to sell something, this would kind of be my reaction, like, oh, are you serious? Um, followed quickly by me just kind of sobbing in the bathroom because it really just doesn't come to me naturally. Uh, so let's check the attendance. Has anybody logged off? Okay, still got you guys. Well, I understand if you would leave right now, but let me explain to you what I'm actually doing here. So the reason I'm here is because I am a lot more like you than any sales rep is. I am somebody who does PPC for a living. I've been at WordStream for almost five years at this point. Um, I originally started managing clients' accounts. So I was the one kind of in the accounts doing the dirty work, um, managing the accounts or helping them manage the accounts. Um, and a lot of these clients were agencies. So I was helping them retain clients, upsell clients, and get brand new clients. And over time, I started to develop a sales strategy that's really specific to people like me, people who like doing paid search, people who want to spend their time doing paid search, not the type of people who want to be kind of slamming the phone day after day begging people to purchase their services. Um, so I'm like you. I am... PBC evangelist, I blog, I speak, I teach about digital marketing tactics, and I don't enjoy doing sales. So my goal today is to teach you guys how to sell in a way that works for you. Now, we as PBC managers are all super, super, super busy. Like it is so hard to find the time to sell because you're so busy working in client accounts, right? Doing what is your bread and butter. Um, so what we 
don't want to do in selling these new accounts is sell all of these teensy tiny accounts. Because what that means is you will constantly, constantly be working leads, constantly be kind of enveloped in the sales process, and you'll have no time to work in accounts. So instead of focusing our efforts on these teensy tiny accounts, I want you to have this bigger is better strategy. I think we can all agree bigger is always better. Um, and that is the mentality you should have when it comes to sales. If you can land a big fish, you'll be able to take a break, stop focusing on sales, and actually think about managing this client's account. So that's what we're going to talk about today. These are my top five hacks to help you score a big fish. Now, first things first, if you want to nail one of these enormous clients, you have to learn to walk the walk. And I think that's, for some of us, the hardest part. You know, you look at these big agencies, these big guys, and it's like, what does he have that you don't? They have a huge following. They have a PR team that's getting their name in the news left and right. They have this enormous group of followers on Twitter, and they've made a name for themselves. And not only that, but they have the resources to cultivate this. Like I said, they have a PR team. They have the financial resources to really dedicate a ton of time. Um, and if you don't have this daddy Warbucks kind of taking care of your PR strategy and helping you manage it, what do you do? How do you do that? Well, you need to jumpstart your reputation on the cheap, right? How can we do this? First things first, you need to create a few pieces of amazing content. This content is going to be the cornerstone of your brand new reputation strategy. So how do you create amazing content? Um, it's actually quite counterintuitive. So I remember when I first started writing content for WordStream, I focused on writing things that were highly technical. I thought they were super interesting. Uh, unfortunately, no one else did, or no one that wasn't super techy and PPC oriented like I was. So what I've learned to do is actually rely on this tool called BuzzSumo. And what BuzzSumo does is it helps you analyze other websites and identify their most highly shared pieces of content. This is a really good jumping off point because if you can figure out what's working for these people and emulate it, you can very quickly create a couple pieces of really strong, almost viral content. So what I did is, um, in this case, I look at HubSpot, right? HubSpot is in the same realm as WordStream. They're not a direct competitor, but the things that work for them are things that are going to work for us too. So I did a search for HubSpot. I figured out what was working for them, and I created blog posts similar to that. I also did this with BuzzFeed earlier this year. Um, so I saw this article. It was 25 signs that you're a waitress. And I thought, huh, you know, what if I created something that was like 18 signs or a digital marketer? It would be kind of fun. I could crowdsource some of the ideas. Wasn't really thinking much of it. It got a, more than 1,000 shares. It just like took this industry by storm. People thought it was interesting. People were sharing it left and right and engaging with it. So it was really easy to create this content. All I had to do was plug BuzzFeed into BuzzSumo, figure out what was working, and then kind of put a spin on it that worked for our industry. And you can definitely do the same. So when it comes to creating content, you don't need to create a lot of content. You need to create a couple really, really highly engaging pieces. And then you need to start buying some Twitter followers, right? You can't, you can't ever tell anyone you have this amazing reputation if they look at you on Twitter and see that you have no followers and no one engaging with you. But you don't want to buy Twitter followers for anybody from anyone like this guy. He looks pretty shady. Instead, you want to buy legitimate Twitter followers. So how do you do this? Create a followers campaign. Twitter literally has the option for you to do this built into their ad interface. Um, create a followers campaign. Now, you might be thinking, oh, it's going to be expensive, and I don't have the money for this. Well, if you can be really, really strategic about who you put into this campaign, you're actually not going to waste a ton of money. So what you can do is create this highly, highly targeted group. And only put, a, you know, maybe 50 bucks towards it a day, right? Use a tiny bit of money because you're hitting just the right people. 
And if you can get these people to follow you and get these people to share and engage with your content because they're relevant, they're in this industry and they probably have friends in this industry, all of a sudden you'll be able to kind of see those multipliers occur. And then finally, take the best content and only promote that. Don't throw everything at the wall. You don't have the money to do this. Take the content that has already performed well, that's proven to perform well, and only promote your best stuff. And boom, you'll have overnight popularity, you'll have this reputation automatically built up for you. So that brings me to point number two, which is you need to devise a prospect hit list. What do I mean by this? Figure out exactly who you're gonna work with. Um, and start by looking at the 10 biggest average spenders. Okay, so this list is a list of the people who spend the most money in AdWords by industry. You see finance and insurance, they're huge spenders. Some retailers and general merchandise, makes a lot of sense. Travel and tourism, jobs and education, the list goes on. The key is to only pick one of these, one industry. And then really get to know it inside and out, right? So if you pick retail, do all of your research. Understand the retail industry. Understand the KPIs that retailers are most highly focused on and tools and um, strategies you can use for this particular group of people. And then take it one step further. Get up to date on the industry specific tactics. So for example, if you've chosen the retail industry, dive in and understand how to build a shopping feed and how to run a shopping campaign. That's going to be one of the most critical things for you to understand if you're part of this, if you're working with this industry. And finally, get to know betas so you can get ahead of the curve. If you're talking to prospects about betas that their current agency or in-house person doesn't know about, they're going to be floored. Right, so you want to make sure you know all of the betas pertinent to that particular industry so you can get ready to have that sales conversation. So for example, if you're focused on retailers, you should get to know the buy button. Know everything that you could possibly need to know about getting into this beta and having the buy button work for your clients. Number three, get on your prospect's radar. So now you've built this reputation, you know exactly who you want to connect with, but you actually need to connect with them, right? You need to, you need to help these people figure out who you are. So first things first, buddy up to them on LinkedIn. Get in front of them on LinkedIn. That way they'll start to recognize your name and your brand. But before you do this, Please, please, please make sure the time to make sure your take the time to make sure your profile looks better than my dad's profile because this is pretty embarrassing for him. I don't, I don't think he'd be thrilled to know I was sharing this with you guys. Um, and most importantly, if somebody looks at this, there's no way they're going to be impressed by or want to engage with you. So take take the time to bling out your profile. You can do this little trick with skills and endorsements. I call it reciprocal endorsing. And that's when you ask your friends or family or colleagues to endorse you for particular skills. And in return, you'll endorse them. So I asked all my friends, you know, give me 10 endorsements, I'll endorse you 10 times too. And as you can see, I've built up this huge arsenal of skills and endorsements. In fact, I look pretty impressive, right? So do this to build out your profile. If you're AdWords certified or Bing certified, which you should absolutely take the time to do, it's one afternoon and it's gonna be it's gonna make you look way more impressive on your resume. So make sure you're including these certifications on LinkedIn and you're keeping them up to date. And finally, get some family or most importantly, existing clients to provide recommendations on your profile. That's gonna help provide context about who you are and what you can do for these potential clients. And then you have to connect with them. So write these connection requests that they can't turn down. Um, Larry Kim has this strategy, he calls it the five Ps, and he swears by it. He said, if you can write a message that incorporates all of these five Ps, 
then the person will not be able to resist connecting with you. So be polite, pertinent, personalized, professional, and praiseful. I didn't believe him, to be honest, so I gave this a shot myself. I picked five kind of reach candidates, people that I really wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn, but I figured there was no way they would do it. And I tried this message. And you know what? It did work. So connect with people using these thoughtful messages. Once you've connected with them on LinkedIn, you also want to make sure you're infiltrating their Facebook. Make sure that they get to know your brand and get your brand in front of them as much as possible so they start to develop this recognition. The best way to do this is through Facebook ads. And again, like I said before, I know you don't have the resources to really spend a ton of money on this, but you absolutely can you know, put a small bit of money, 25, 50 bucks a day, toward these campaigns. So first, create hyper-targeted campaigns. Take that big fish hit list, plug that into your targeting, and then go one step further and get a little bit more granular with their job titles. So you don't only want to you know, get in front of people who work at American Apparel. You don't want to get in front of somebody who works at the desk or the stocking centers. Instead, you want to get in front of the people who are on the marketing team at American Apparel, the people who are most likely to be decision makers and be you know, potentially hiring a new agency. That's the group you want to get in front of. So if you create this highly, highly targeted campaign, you'll be able to do so. Okay, so we've branded ourselves, we're getting in front of these people. Now we need to actually connect and have a conversation with them. And the key with this is you have to do it in a really tenacious manner. You can't give up too quickly. And if you're not really a salesperson, this might be a challenge for you. So here's some rules of thumb to follow. First things first, um, we took a look at connect rates for sales conversations. Um, so Insight Squared created this graph. We actually plotted our internal stats and it looks very, very similar. The bottom line is your first attempt is the attempt that's most likely to connect with your prospect. So you need to go into that call prepared. Right? You can't be surprised that they pick up on the first try. You need to go in and nail your first try. Key here is nobody really wants to hear a sales pitch, right? If somebody calls you and that sales guy is laying it on thick and giving you this intense sales pitch, it's a huge turnoff. So resist the urge to launch into a sales pitch and instead listen to them and ask them discovery questions. So here's what we recommend with regards to discovery questions. First things first, ask them what the current state is of their account. Right? How are you guys doing? How are you performing? And then ask them what the desired state is for their account. Right? Have them start thinking about the future, what they would like to see. Now the critical thing here is you, if you can get them talking about this, they're going to start thinking in their head, oh, you know, if I did get 10 more leads a month or 10 more conversions a month, that would give me the ability to, I don't know, hire a whole new person. Um, so once they start thinking about the, what these numbers mean to them, thinking about the future, they're going to get excited. And then the last thing you need to ask them is what is their timeline? And then the kicker is using PPC or whatever service you're selling to bridge the gap from A, current state of the account, to B, desired state of the account, in C, amount of time. And if you can paint this picture and make this reality come true for them and show them that you can do this, that's really going to help them understand that you're a good fit for their account. So be the white knight, right? Take the opportunity to, to understand their pain points, to take their challenges, not just complain about them with them, but be the white knight and provide solutions to these challenges. Now, there is a possibility you're going to get their voicemail. Very, very possible. We know that there's only about a 20% connect rate at that first chance. 
So if you do get their voicemail, just make sure you make that interaction count. Tell them who you are, explain your intentions, and give them a reason to call you back. Now, if they don't call you back and you don't connect with them right there on the first go, um, your inclination might be to, to kind of pull back, right? You do one or two calls, they don't call you back, they don't want to talk to you, you don't want to be annoying to them. And, and as you can see here, the likelihood of connecting with these people doesn't plateau until about six attempts, but you and I, people who don't have that sales DNA, we feel like stalkers if we do this. We feel like we are kind of harassing people if we're calling them six times. The key is you need to defy these natural instincts and pick up the phone again. Sales guys are relentless with their phone calls, but they're relentless because it works. And you need to adopt, adapt to the strategy. So here's a general rule of thumb you can follow. Now, you don't need to take these numbers kind of uh, as Bible. Instead, take these numbers and, and figure out what works well for your business. So as a general rule of thumb, people who don't have a ton of time to be doing sales, low quality prospects deserve a three touch minimum, right? You need to give it at least three tries before you hang up and give up. For good prospects, those medium prospects that can yield quite a bit for you, you want to go in with a mindset of having at minimum seven touch points. Even if it doesn't feel natural to you, you need to connect at a minimum of seven times. And for those top-notch prospects, you need to connect at minimum 11 times, if not more. Now, you don't want to do this on two days, right? You don't want to slam these people with phone calls. And you do want to make sure anytime you do have any sort of conversation or leave a message with them, that you are making an impression that's positive. Um, but the key is don't give up. And even if you do kind of pull back for a little while, three months later, pull up this prospect again and keep working them. Because it is going to be a longer process and it's okay to have these continuous attempts. All right, and then finally, tip number five, when you do get them on the phone, be prepared to conquer these objections with real life examples. So every time you get into a sales conversation, no matter how positively or negatively these people feel, um, they might be totally sold on you, but they're still going to throw out a few objections. They're kind of testing the waters with you. The cool thing about selling digital services is nine times out of ten, you can predict these objections before they even happen. So listen to the objections. Clarify them, restate them, cushion, and respond. This is the process that we use here at WordStream to ensure that we're really catering to these objections, hearing them out, and then giving them smart, thoughtful responses. So one of the objections we hear most frequently is SEO is good enough for me, right? Um, you've probably heard this a million times. The reality is SEO, while it is beneficial, you don't have a ton of control over it. And most of us marketers are control freaks. And we want to control what the listing looks like and what landing page it's directing to. With SEO, they can't do this. And you need to remind them of that. Also, remind them of these guys. So when the average person looks at this slide, they're probably like, oh, Zoo animals, how cute. I love pandas and penguins and hummingbirds. Um, but to the marketer, when they see this, they kind of like shirk back in their seats and they almost have this PTSD type feeling towards these dreaded animals because these are the nicknames for the SEO updates that have destroyed many of our lives. Um, these animals, these Cute looking animals can hit at any time. You never know which is the new animal Google's going to add to the list. Um, but you need to remind people of these. Remind them that at any time Google can strike with these updates and it can dramatically impact their SEO standing. So SEO not quite as reliable as you may want it to be. Thirdly, um, I think a lot of people think. Well, SEO is good enough for me because nobody actually clicks on ads. But again, the reality here is people do click on ads. 
So for high intent terms, we see that people are 64.6 6 people click on ads. Only 35% of people click on the organic listing. Why is this? Well, Google ensures that our ads are highly relevant. Google ensures that these ads have extra bells and whistles like pictures and ratings alongside them. So for average or for searchers, they're like, it doesn't matter if it's an ad, if it's giving them what they're looking for. And make sure that your prospects understand this. If they think they can solely rely on SEO, and then they see SEO only really gets 35% of hits from high intent people, they're going to be like, holy crap, I am missing out on a huge group of potential customers just because I'm not doing paid search. That speaks for itself. Next, they need to be mindful that mobile dramatically impacts SEO. Um, we're finally at this tipping point where we're seeing that more than half of Google searches happen on mobile, not desktop. And we're going to see that number continue to increase. What does that mean for SEO? Pretty terrifying. Let me show you why. So see that you're up here in Boston with one of our notorious snowstorms. You're stranded and you want to get a hotel by the airport. What do you do? Pull out your cell phone and you look for a service to book that hotel. So you do a search for a hotel by the airport Boston. You have two options here. You have Expedia, which is offering these hotels right by the airport with wonderful amenities. There are links to check out really good deals and rates. And you can see the rating right along the side of it. That's pretty appealing. Or you can scroll two full scrolls to see Hilton's ad. And this Hilton's listing, this organic listing, while it is number one for the organic listing, A, I had to scroll twice to see it, and B, it's, it's not really appealing. Like, there's no cool stars and extra links and stuff. So your eyes aren't really drawn to it. Now, if you're Hilton and you see this, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm totally missing out here, right? Even though I felt good about my organic standing, not using PPC in conjunction with it is really harming you. So you definitely pick Expedia. The bottom line here is SEO isn't a bad thing. In fact, I would encourage all of my clients to engage in SEO, consider SEO, and think about SEO. But SEO is 10 times stronger when you're coupling it with paid search, right? As you can see here at WordStream, we focus heavily on both of those things, and we're able to dominate this page. In fact, we see a lift in our SEO clicks simply because the branded um, ad is right at the top. So your SEO is kind of padded by PPC and vice versa. So bottom line, these two work better when they're together. Another common objection we hear is PPC just didn't really work for us in the past. Well, if that's the case, your client or prospect was probably doing it wrong, especially if you're working with one of these top industries that we know PPC works for. So figure out why it didn't work for them. Dig up the old account and find the culprit. Here are common culprits we see. First things first, crappy accounts, right? The account was poorly organized by the last account owner. They have ads that aren't relevant to the keywords, landing pages that aren't relevant. Maybe they even aren't using negative keywords. And you might think a big brand would never make a mistake like that. Well, that's totally wrong. Look at this example. Um, I did a search for install Windows PC. More than half of the top six ads are for Windows, like Windows for a house. Just because those brands like Lowe's, Comfort Windows, Home Improvement Gallery didn't think to set PC as a negative keyword. A huge misstep that can result in you know, significantly poorer results for that particular account. Another common example, abuse of dynamic keyword insertion, which can totally backfire on you. So for those of you who aren't familiar with dynamic keyword insertion, this is a little snippet of code that advertisers will put in their ads that will dynamically substitute the keyword that the searcher matches to in the title of their ad. eBay totally took advantage of this strategy, kind of went bananas with it, uh, used it across the board for their ads, 
bid on every keyword on the box. And as you can see, it resulted in these really silly ads. So if you see that dynamic keyword insertion was used across the board in that client's old account, that was probably the culprit for some negative performance. Next, they have crappy landing pages. Um, if any of you guys are fans of Space Jam, which I was when I was eight, <laughs> um, you might know that the Space Jam website has never been updated. So if you check it now, it looks the exact same way it did in 1996. This is pretty cool. I think um, I like looking at it for nostalgic purposes. It's like a cool reminder of the old internet. Um, however, if your client's pages look anything like Space Jam's pages, that's a huge, huge problem. And it's no wonder they weren't doing well, because they probably were turning people off when they saw these crappy landing pages, or people couldn't figure out how to convert, so they weren't bothering to convert. So if they were using crappy landing pages in the past and then saw that PPC wasn't working for them, this is very likely the reason why. Next, we see this one all the time, too. People said PPC didn't work for them, but the main reason was they never actually set up conversion tracking. If you don't have a way to track conversions, there is no way to know whether PPC is working for you. You can get an inkling. You can find out if there's traffic and volume, but you don't know if those leads are actually turning into customers. So if these prospects didn't have conversion tracking set up or even call tracking set up in the past, then they really don't know what leads were coming from a paid search and which ones weren't. And then lastly, uh, this is my, my favorite kind of faux pas that we see, is that people didn't leverage the almighty power of remarketing. And, and I, I truly believe this is like an almighty power. Um, I liken it to taking a girl out on a date. Now you take a girl out on a date, she's probably not going to convert that first date. Probably have to take her to dinner a few times, take her to the movies, and then eventually she'll go home with you. Um, for a lot of your clients, or, or a lot of their clients, it's probably very similar, right? You know, um, if I'm buying a vacation, I'm not going to buy it the first time I see it. I need to think about it. You need to court me a little bit, and then maybe eventually I will buy it. So this is why remarketing is so valuable. Um, I'm going to Las Vegas in a couple weeks. I was looking for a hotel, and I wanted to stay at a hotel on the cheap. So as you can see here, I had some real winners on my list, you know, super cheap hotels. And right before I booked, I thought to myself, you know, I always wanted to stay at the Cosmopolitan on the Strip. Wonder if they have any deals. Let's check out how much it is a night. So I go to the website, check it out, and it was way outside my price range, like dramatically outside my price range. So I log off, you know, never got to buy my hotel, but certainly knew I wasn't going to stay at the Cosmopolitan. Next thing you know, I got a remarketing ad, and it was like, have a nightcap with your breakfast. I was like, ah, oh, sounds pretty nice. I'd like to have a nightcap with my breakfast. And then I saw the next ad. Feast from a totally free mini bar for the length of your stay. And I was like, I love free mini bars. That also sounds great. And then I saw that the rooms were huge. And then I saw this final ad, and it said just the right amount of wrong. And I was like, yeah, I want the right amount of wrong on my vacation in Vegas. And the next thing you knew, I'm like on the site, like pulling out my credit card because God knows I couldn't put this on my debit card and buying a suite at the Cosmopolitan that I definitely could not afford. Um, so remarketing, it really works wonders because you can get in people's heads. And, I, you know, I work in this industry. I make these ads. I, I know what's going on, and I still fall for it because I just, you know, you get so excited. Um, so remarketing is incredibly powerful. If your, if your prospects in the past were not using remarketing and they were trying to sell anything that required any consideration before purchase, if they weren't running remarketing, there is no way they were pulling in as many conversions as they could have. 
And then finally, the last common objection we hear is, I'm happy with my current agency. Um, okay, cool, you're happy with your current agency. Do you think there's room for opportunity? How about a free account analysis? Right? Who's going to turn down a free account analysis? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, okay, Erin, you just told me I don't have time to be selling a ton of deals, and I don't have the money to do this. So why on earth would I be giving all of this hard work away for free? Seems counterintuitive, right? Well, the good news is uh, here at WordStream, we actually have a tool called a grader report that does this for you in a matter of seconds. So the way the grader report works is you plug in your prospect's credentials or your own credentials if they'll invite you to join uh, or if they allow you to put them in their MCC, your MCC. Plug them in. In minutes, less than a minute really, we run this report. And this report compares them to others in their industry and gives them a grade. And not only does it give them a grade, but it goes in depth and tells you why they get this grade. And they have no idea that third party is running this report, right? They don't need to know that you plugged it into this. All you need to do is provide them with the report. So run this report for them, and then dive in and identify the sections that are scariest, right? The sections that they need to know about. Now this one is my favorite. When the prospect scores a low score in the account activity section, that's bad news. This particular prospect, as you can see, their account activity in comparison to competitors in their industry is rated at an 11%. 11%. Imagine you are paying an agency to help you run your account, and they're in it 11% of the time in comparison to others. I feel like you're fired immediately, right? Um, so if you can show them things like this that really indicate that their current agency isn't doing as much as it could be doing, and you would, you're ready to tackle these challenges for them, that's going to really aid you in the sales process. Now, finally, I wanted to add in this quick bonus. Um, you know, hopefully I swayed some of you guys and, and have showed you that you really can be successful salespeople even if you always felt like you kind of sucked at sales. Um, but if you really don't feel like doing it, another option is to pass the box. So the reality is people really, really love to share their good experiences. We see this particularly with the millennial market. Um, in fact, nearly half of millennials promote positive experiences with brands through social media. And if you can give them a way to promote it on, their, on your own site, that's like amazing free advertising. So encourage existing clients to share good experiences that they've had with you. Now, the reason this is so cool is because people tend to be more influenced by world of mouth marketing than traditional marketing. So 89% of millennials trust their friends over brands, right? They care about what their friends say. People who have had direct experience and aren't, are kind of like impartial, you know? They don't want to hear an advertiser say, <laughs> come use my stuff, they want to hear their friends say, I had this amazing experience with this agency, and you should too. So, here's what you need to do. Give those happy customers an added incentive to spread the word about your product. You know, Uber credits all of their success to this concept of a referral program, where they say, hey, if you like our service, then send your friends a positive review of us, we'll give them a free ride, and in return, if they sign on, we'll give you a free ride too. So that really, that kind of like ignites people to definitely share their experiences and to share it with the people that they think are likely to sign on with you. Now for you as an agency, this is very simple, right? You could say, hey, if you refer somebody who sticks around for six months, we'll give you a free month off. Or we'll give you a 10% discount moving forward. Whatever that may be, you need to craft a program that meets the needs of your, you know, your financials, but this is definitely doable and something that has proven to work. We're seeing more and more companies follow suit. So guys, those are my top five tips. If you want to kind of make it rain and become this super successful agency, you need to vamp up your image, pick your hit list, 
get in front of them and kind of start infiltrating their minds, pick up the phone, call them, don't stop calling them until you connect with them and start the conversation, and then be prepared to conquer those objective, objective, ob objections with real life examples. And if you can do that, you're going to see more and more big fish flood into your agency. So that's it. Good luck. Um, thank you guys so much for kind of having me here and listening in. And Noelle, I'll turn it back to you to uh, kind of close it out. Great, guys. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed today's session. Um, if you guys would like to learn more about WordStream software, uh, we do have a one-hour free AdWords assessment. Hey, free AdWords assessments do work. Um, and if you wanted to try our software and see how it could work for your clients, um, feel free to opt into that as well. And we look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Um, if you are in Boston and you want to come out to our happy hour at Wistia's office tonight, 6.30 to 8.30, we look forward to seeing you guys there. And again, thanks, Erin. We appreciate all of your time. And thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a good digital agency day. And hopefully we'll see a couple of you tonight. Yes. Go forth and prosper. Thanks, guys. <laughs>